Okay, welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today we have a very special speaker who will be familiar to many of you. He is a former senior executive at Grumman and Northrop Grumman, highly respected author, and of course, our board chair, Mr. Mike Simonera. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many fine faces. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about the books that I wrote. A thousand pages, two volumes, took about eight and a half years, one year for COVID, interrupted it. I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Northrop Grumman, who endorsed the project in 2014 via Tom Weiss, sector president at the time, and for granting approval for the license agreement that was, that was given. I want to thank the Western Museum of Flight for access to numerous files and photos and contacts, and in particular to Harvey Mudd College, Iris Critchell, who's now 102, and Michael Palmer, who's in the audience, the archivist, who gave me access to 1,000 historical photos from Roy Wolford, Northrop's associate, that had never been seen before. I'd also like to thank Tony Chong, who's in the audience, the Northrop Grumman Aerospace uh, historian, who gave me good advice and access to a lot of Northrop Grumman photos. And in particular to Aldo Spadoni, the retired advanced program manager of engineering visualization, who generated the genealogy chart, the outstanding book covers that you see here, and 60 charts out of the 845 figures that are in the book. And I particularly appreciate the endorsements from Ken Cressa, from Chris Hernandez, who's already been introduced, from John Wittenberry, Irv Wallen, God Rest His Soul, and Brian Hutt. And thank you for purchasing the books. Now, why this type of book? Well, <clears throat> you can read the words as well as I can, but there's a couple of things. Um, many of us became leaders, and you don't get there by yourself. People help you get there. And so the purpose of the book is to not only understand the history of the company and the aircraft, both manned and unmanned, that they built. There were 79 of them that I covered over 100 years in the two volumes. But also, but also to recognize these people and bring them to life. As Chris Hernandez said, we need to talk about the executors on the B-2 program, all of whom became senior officers in the company and led the company, but really made it happen around Irv Walland and the key people and what have you. The book is divided into, into two volumes. We have the formative years from 1916 through 1938, the startup war years in post-war era, which was a dynamic time led by Northrop up through 1952, the lineage of flying wings and turbodyne, which is separated out from that because they built 13 of those things, which are, and we have the last remnant of it here in the, in the uh, museum. And then the lineage of trainer and fighter aircraft, which spans the entire history of, of the company. The second volume talks about the evolution of stealth and the lineage of the B-2. Uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that. Then we have the lineage of unmanned systems. That's a very long chapter but we do talk about the developments from both Teledyne Ryan and from radio plane. And then we talk about tech demonstrators, close air support, and legacy programs. The tech demonstrators were the X-21 and the uh, lifting bodies. Uh, the, uh, uh, the legacy programs were the E-2C, the, the C-2 uh, cargo aircraft, and of course the Growler. And then I wrap it up by talking about over 40 people who I think were a lot of those key leaders. Now I just want to show you a picture of the genealogy chart. Uh, those of you who, who bought the book um, uh, will get a copy of this. Um, unfortunately it wasn't the highest quality, but it's okay. But this is 79 aircraft spanning 100 years and both manned and unmanned that I talk about in the book. And now we come to how the book starts. It doesn't start with talking about airplanes. It talks about Betty Johansing, who was the surviving daughter of Jack Northrop. 
At the time I interviewed her, she was 95 years old. Sharp, well-dressed, just an amazing person. It took a long time to get to her. And I asked her, what kind of a man was your father? Well, he was a, a genius of a designer, according to her. And um, he was a very, very caring man. He was very humble. He kept his friendships a long time, both aerospace leaders and colleagues and military officers. He had deep respect and admiration for Bill Boeing. He even helped Ed Heineman from Douglas buy a house. He worked seven days a week except vacations and family outings, and he kept a drawing board in his, dead, in his den 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sketching out airplanes. Remarkable. Now the next chart talks about the companies he worked with. It's a little busy. The vertical chart is the maximum speed. The horizontal chart are calendar years. And on the lower portion, you can see the companies that he worked for. Low head means Lockheed, Douglas, Lockheed Aircraft, Avion, which was his company, Northrop Aircraft, and then the Northrop Corporation up until 38. And those little arrows coming up show you the type of airplanes that he was designing. Two key things, streamlining and extremely strong structures was the underpinning of his design philosophy, and shall, which I'll tell you about. Now, I, I didn't select all the airplanes, but the next one I selected was the Vega. This was probably one of the most outstanding designs in the 20th century. It was conceived on my own, as, as Northrop said, and I left Douglas to promote it. Uh, it was a revolutionary change in aircraft design. It had a cantilever wing, as you can see, top mounted with the wing spar attached to the fuselage. Quite remarkable. It had a low drag symmetrical fuselage that included the pilot and four passengers. It had fairings for the wing and cockpit windshield. It was a highly adaptable design. They only made 14 variants of it. Would you believe that? Incredible. And he hired a young man by the name of Gerald Volte to help him do stress analysis. You've heard, all heard about the Consolidated Volte Corporation? Well, that was the guy. And uh, there he is right there in the, in the right-hand photo in the center of the fuselage. That's Jerry Volte right there. So the other thing that happened is that um, on the S-1, which was developed with the Lockheed aircraft, I didn't show you that, they devised a way of manufacturing curved plywood forms to make a fuselage. Until then, the fuselages were all truss structures, usually covered with linen or what have you. And it took them 21 months of trial and error, and they patented it. And that's how they built that streamlined fuselage on the aircraft. Now we come to the Avion Corporation. This was established in 1929. You see the patent there. Uh, Northrop had this burning desire for flying wings. Now, he, he knew a lot about the aerodynamics because he flew a lot of gliders and what have you, but he wasn't so up on the stability control, so he went to the conventional boom surface with controls at the time. He ended up with a very thick section, 25%. It had quite a large wing area, and it flew, flew quite well and formed the backbone of the company. Bill Boeing came and looked at it and bought the company and brought it into his company. Now the next chart uh, is really a, a busy one. This talks about the alpha, the beta, the delta, and the gamma. So on the upper left is the alpha. The beta is on the, on the upper right. The, the delta is on the lower left, a transport airplane. And the famous gamma is on the, on the right. And what's so unique about them? Well, they were all metal stress skin monocoque fuselages with a multicellular structure. Uh, the Alpha had wing fillets, the first application of that. It had rubber de-icing boots for the first time, and the latest radio equipment. And uh, there's a side story by Ed Heineman, who actually ran Douglas later on in life, who worked for him. He said Northrop found this machine in Sweden where he could test structural samples. So he bought this machine, brought it to where he was located, and he tested thousands of of, of test articles to prove that his calculations were right. And I'll show you, he created what's called the multicellular structure. It was absolutely the strongest structure in aviation at that time in the world. Absolutely amazing. The beta on the upper right was a small sport airplane. It was about 1,800 pounds versus 4,500 for the Alpha. Uh, they, they made an advanced version of it, 
By the way, Jack Northrop implied Donovan Berlin, who went on to design the P-40 Warhawk, as well as Ed Heinemann, who was another famous designer. But Donovan uh, cleaned the airplane up, used something called dihedral for the first time. The Army liked it, but they didn't buy it. The Delta was a very successful airplane. They bought 32 of them. It could carry a, pass a, a good passenger load with a pilot co-pilot. It was single engine, but they got done in by the CAA at the time, the Civilian Air Authority, who said, you can't use a single engine passenger carrying airplane flying at night over inhos inhospitable terrain. So that was the end of that. But then we come to the Gamma on the lower right. This was a winner. It weighed about 7,400 pounds. It could almost go 225 miles an hour. Had a range of 2,000 miles. They made 17 derivatives of it. They were used them for Antarctic exploration, attack aircraft, dive bombers, fighters, civil, commercial, and foreign sales. Really a remarkable achievement. Now I come to something called the advanced wing design. Now there's the multicellular structure on the left. That's a cutaway of the wing, and you can see the structure. They were small boxes, and one of the alphas crashed. The cables had snapped. It was a 9G pullout. The pilot was able to get out. It crashed, and the wing was not destroyed. Northrop came along and ordered a tractor. You can see it with the large cylindrical wheels to see if he could crush the wing. It did not crush. Okay. Okay. Now, Northrop then uh, established his own company in 1939. And the first airplane out of the box was the Norwegian N3PB float plane. Uh, they had a very aggressive board that I speak about, and they reached out to gain sales. So they contacted Norway because they knew they were interested, and they came out with a type spec, and they created the N3PB float plane. Now this is a very streamlined design. It looks a lot like the Gamma, and uh, it was all metal monocoque construction with highly streamlined float planes, and it flew extremely well. Uh, it had a, a crew of three, a streamlined tanning seating, seating, a streamlined fuselage, a rugged structure, and a proven engine. It weighed almost 8,000 pounds. Unfortunately, all of them were destroyed in World War II, but one of them was found by the government in Norway, and they came to Northrop in the 70s, and they said, can you rebuild it for us? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what was the birth of our museum today. So it's quite a historical fact. Now we come to the P-61. This is an absolutely remarkable airplane. Uh, what do we know about it? Well, in the upper left, you can see the patent drawing. On the lower right, you can see the early version of it, and you can see the immense firepower that it had. Well, there were new technologies being developed on both sides of the Atlantic, both in England and the United States in the 30 to 40 time period. It was the forerunner of a more sophisticated fighter, where they had to balance aircraft performance with weapon system performance. There was a word that came out called integration for the first time. Imagine, that's where it started. And the English had an excellent air defense system at the time, but they did not have a good night fighter interceptor. So Northrop had a dialogue with them, and they came away with some general requirements. Long loiter time, additional fuel for sustained combat, sufficient high altitude capability, good low speed maneuverability, and the Brits wanted a multi-engine with heavy firepower. How about that for a requirement? Okay. So the result was the P-61. It's a big airplane, much bigger than the P-38 that that gentleman flew over there. It had three long fuselages right there, twin engines, separate long crew fuselage with three, three to four men, large wing area, tricycle landing gear. It was, visibility was critical on it, and the wing area was sized for excellent landing. By the way, there's a side story that up at Harvey Mudd College, Iris Critchell flew the P-61 in World War II in delivering it. And I asked her about it, how did it fly? And with that, remember at the time she was 100 years old, right? She said, just a moment. She went into the file cabinet and pulled out a book. She read the book for 20 minutes, and then she told me how it flew. It was the flight manual from the P-61 from 1943. Anyway, great story. OK, now we come to the F-89. Um, this is 
probably America's most heavily armed aircraft at the time. There's a comparison on the lower right between the P-61 and the F-89D. They built about a thousand of the F-89s. The D version there had the wingtip pods where they could fire a lot of rockets, and the uh, J version was the only interceptor we had that fired nuclear-tipped missiles. They converted 350 of these airplanes to fire nuclear missiles at the expected Soviet threat coming over the North, North Pole. So really, really an amazing achievement and what have you. Now we come to the snark. Okay? That's a medieval a monster that Jack Northrop picked. And it's a highly criticized program. It was a failure. It was not a failure. What happened is that after the war, the Department of Defense and the Air Force were looking at ballistic missiles, ramjet-powered missiles, and cruise missiles. And Jack Northrop said, OK, we'll design a long-range cruise missile with a 5,000-mile range. The first flight was the N-25 on the left. The final flight was the SM-62. Ten years later, it went operational where it was launched from Maine against Target. It could literally go 5,000 miles. Now, what happened, of course, is that over a period of time, the warhead tripled in weight. How about that? They changed the requirement. The range, they asked for three times the amount of range, and the weight doubled from 28 to 62,000 pounds. So Northrop had to develop something called a program management organization to manage it. It could not be managed using the traditional engineering, manufacturing way of building airplanes. They created a program management structure for the first time. He did that with a lot of advice from a lot of folks. And uh, did it work? Yes, it worked, and then they retired it. And uh, they not only had to do all the integration, but they had to develop an entire logistics support system, including the launch track, the JATO bottles, integrate the whole thing, and make it happen. It was not a failure, ladies and gentlemen. Now we come to another chapter, which is called The Realization of a Dream. This is where Northrop, in the late 30s, in addition to managing the companies, was out in the desert flying model aircraft of 48 to 60 inches in span of flying wings. And he made some sketches. On the upper left, you see a picture of the, of the, uh, the avion. And those are the sketches that led to the N1M Jeep that I'm about to tell you about. And there it is right there, ladies and gentlemen, an absolutely remarkable airplane for its day. It was a flying wing. And uh, it had drooped wingtips at the time. That's the design team right below it, right there. And it was very successful. It had a wing area of 300 square feet. It uh, weighed about almost 4,000 pounds. It was underpowered, only had two 65 horsepower engines. But the bottom line was the tests were successful. Now what happened, the war started. And he was very close to the generals in the Air Force. Okay? They came to him and they said, we want you to design a strategic bomber. So in 1942, he gets a contract to build the XB-35, which I'm going to tell you about. Imagine that, all right? And that weighed nominally 155,000 pounds, which I'll, which I'll tell you about. So we go from the N1M, the demonstrator, at 3,900. The, the N9, they built four of those in the upper left, which were flying prototypes of the XB-35 in terms of flying qualities. That's in the, that's in the upper right, the XB-35. The, the YB-49 is on the lower left, and the RB-49A, which was redesigned, is on the lower right. That was a reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, absolutely remarkable airplanes. So again, the N1M was 3,900, the N9, 7,100 pounds, and the XB-35 ended up at 155,000 pounds. It was actually tested at over 200,000. So Northrop firmly believed that the flying wing had lower drag, lower structural weight, greater structural efficiency, easier to maintain, easier to manufacture, and harder to detect. He was right. He was right. And Northrop, of course, builds flying wings today. So there were a lot of lessons learned, though, what happened because they did not fly on time. They flew after the war, and uh, the XB-45 
49 flew very, very well. What happened is that the powertrain in the XB35 was powered by a 3,000 horsepower engine, four of them, one with a 28-foot shaft going through the fuselage to the pusher propellers in the back, and um, they just did not work. They broke down. In fact, they, they, they lost. Many of them were, were not well, well prepared when they tested them. So the, the Army Air Force canceled the program. In the meantime, Northrop ordered the redesign using the same airframe into the YB-49. It flew quite well. It did have a weathercocking problem, as you probably have read about at the time, that they could not correct aerodynamically, but they did order something called an autopilot. But it was after the war, and it did not sink in time, and they canceled the program, which I think personally was a tragedy, but because the RB-49A was redesigned and ready to go, and they just let it sit in the desert for three years. But that's, that's life. But anyway, that's just a little bit of a peek at that. And uh, the, the main issue is that because of the manpower and the lack of space, they could not deliver it before the end of the war. My conjecture is, and again, this is just a small opinion, was that perhaps if it flew before the end of the war, they might have been able to make some of these changes. But that's just uh, conjecture. The, the last chart I wanted to show you was the final assembly on the left of the XB-35 and the YB-49 on the right. So what you see there um, are the elevons on the, on the, uh, on the XB-35 in the down position, the rudders located on the wingtips uh, that uh, form a portion of the trim tabs, flaps, and what have you, and the YB-49 on the right, you can see the additional area that they had to add because they eliminated the nacelles in the back that provided a lot of stability. Absolutely incredible what they achieved in, in, in doing this when you read about it. Northrop retired in 52. He still was active in the company to some degree um, with uh, training and what have you, but they brought in what I call the changing of the guard. And these were remarkable people. On the upper left is Edgar Schmood. He came from North American. He was very involved in the development of the P-51, and he led the development of the F-86, which is in, in, the, in the hangar. Bill Ballhouse, senior, is on the upper right. He was a graduate of Stanford. He worked at Douglas on literally everything, bombers, supersonic research aircraft, and what have you. And at Convair, he was the chief of preliminary design, and then he became the chief engineer at Northrop when he came in. And on the lower left was Wilco Gasich. Now in his day, he was six, seven feet tall. Big, tall man. I got to know him when he was 95. He just recently died at 100. Absolutely remarkable man. He was chief of preliminary design and was behind the, the design philosophy of the F-5, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. He became director of advanced systems in 56, and then he became a corporate officer of the, of the company. And then on the lower right is Tom Jones. Everybody's heard that name? Well, he was a distinguished scholar from Stanford, brilliant man, and he worked for the Rand Corporation. Gasich, uh, Wilco, urged him to come to Northrop, which he did. He became corporate VP of development planning and then CEO in 1960. So the changing of the guard was very successful. They had great leadership. Now we come to something called the T-38 N-156 evolution. And you'll begin to see some pictures of people. Now, in this book, I interviewed over 150 people from north of Grumman. Many of them have passed on, and they identified other key people. So remember, one of the purposes of the book was to remember these people and bring them to life. So that's woven throughout the entire book. And that's a, that is the sketch of the, uh, the patent sketch of the F-5 that became the T-38, the T which eventually evolved in the F-5. And Lee Began and George Gluyas, who's a very senior aerodynamicist, and then Wilco Gasich and Neumann and Gardner, who was the program manager. Neumann was from GE. Those are some of the, some of the key people uh, in that. And uh, so we'll be talking a lot about that. But what was stressed here was safety, good flying qualities, engine accessibility remained in the, uh, uh, was retained in the fuselage, the boarding ladder, the Norrail manufacturing system, very low life cycle cost and performance. So compared with the F-100 trainer, it was like almost two to one 
in maintenance, man hours per flight hour, and life cycle costs and what have you. Just blew it right out of the water. Okay, this is a genealogy chart, thanks to Ron Gibb, who's in the front audience here. If you look at this, and there's a chart in, in, in the museum about that, they made 31 versions, right? And you can see the little dotted line on the bottom from the F5A all the way to the F5G, which became the F20, which I'm gonna to talk to you about. And they sold them to 34 countries. Many of them are still in operation, and of course, many of you saw the Top Gun film, right? And who do you think some of the adversary aircraft were? F-5s, right, in an advanced version. Now this is another picture of, of the aircraft right here. And uh, it begins with the F-5A on the upper left, the F-5B on the upper right, the F-5E and the F-5F down below. They were preceded, of course, by the T-38 and the N-156, which became a fighter. So from the T-38 to the F-5F, the weight literally doubled from 12,500 pounds to 25,000 pounds, or from the F-5A, we went from 20 to 25. The Mach number increased from roughly 1.4 to 1.6 from the A to the F, and the range went up from roughly 1,400 miles to 1,800 miles on the F. And there's other comparisons with the T-38. So you could see the design philosophy of the company this was a light, low-cost airplane with very high thrust-to-weight engines from GE. Instead of buying a big engine, they bought two small ones with a, which had an inherently better thrust-to-weight. They scaled them up, and they ended up with a long line of airplanes. They built over 3,000 of these things. Absolutely remarkable story. Now we come to the Tiger Shark. This was a risk, uh, but it was a great airplane. Jones, Tom Jones, made the bold decision and a calculation based on the U.S. government defense and international defense aid. Remember, they had delivered by 77, 1,200 T-38s, 2,200 F-5A, B, E, and F, and they had confidence in the Northrop design team. And they indeed, under, under, Bob, under, under Walt Fellers and Andy Scow, who was the chief aerodynamicist, they created an amazing airplane. It was really quite something. It was Mach 2. 9Gs, uh, had all of the high lift benefits gained from the F-5 design, had a digital flight control system, and an advanced avionics cockpit. It was a really remarkable airplane. But what happened, there was a change in the FMS rules. They allowed General Dynamics to put in cheaper avionics in the F-16, and they did not achieve the sales. So it was canceled. And there's only one left. It's in the California Science Center. You can see it's hanging from the ceiling. But as, a, as an achievement in aerodynamic efficiency and performance, it was untouched in during its day. Now we come to a comparison chart. I hope you're still all with me here. And uh, this chart compares the F5A and F5B, who flew in 63 and 72. And they, did, they put together a conceptual design called the P530. It did not fly but it led to the YF-17, which I'm going to tell you about, which we have here at the museum, by the way. And the wing area increased dramatically by from 170 square feet to over 350 square feet on the YF-17. The weight literally doubled from 13 to 19.5 to 23.40. The thrust went up by a factor of three, four times, and the Mach number increased by almost 50%. Absolutely remarkable. So when you come to the, the YF-17, this was a breakthrough design done under, the, done under the new watch. Now, a lot of people say the F-18 is like the YF-17. The answer is no, because it was re heavily redesigned to meet the Navy requirements. But the aerodynamic configuration was not changed that much. Aerodynamically, it was a super airplane. So they teamed with, uh, Northrop teamed with McDonnell Douglas, and they went through major structural modifications, the wing fold, more wing area, landing gear, arresting gear. Uh, they put a new radar system, a new nose, an advanced cockpit, but very heavy emphasis on reliability and maintainability. Now, everybody criticizes the F-18 because it didn't have the range, but it had everything else. It was an extremely reliable airplane. The head of the Pacific Fleet told me one day when I was on the F-14 program, I visited him, he said, Mike, I can turn the F-18 three times in a day. I can turn the F-14 once. 
And there's the difference right there. So. Then uh, this is just a summary chart on the FA-18 Super Hornet. It was led by Lou Carrier, Dick Odom on the upper right, Brian Hunt, uh, who was chief engineer, vice president of the company, and he endorsed the book. And the sky in the lower right is Mike Wolski, one of the greatest manufacturing people you could ever meet on the face of the earth. I got to know him real well. This program was extremely successful. You can read the words. It was on time, on budget, won the Acquisition of Excellence Award, and it won the Collier Trophy. And it's still active today. It's probably going to be phased out over a period of time. But it does represent the front line of defense for our carriers in many ways, and, and offense. Now we come to the YF-23. This is also in our exhibition. Unfortunately, it's not here today because it's undergoing painting. But this was truly a remarkable design. Northrop lost out on this design to the YF-22 designed by Lockheed. But again, if you step back and you look at what Northrop achieved as a balanced design, this was a 50,000 uh, pound stealthy, highly stealthy airplane with a wing area almost 1,000 square feet. And uh, it could achieve Mach 1.5 on mill, mill power. Absolutely remarkable. And uh, the armament was quite extensive. It was quite a fly off. You can see some of the earlier versions on the upper right. And that team right there, uh, Dick Liu and Jaeger, Sandusky, Moore and Wolf were all part of the, of the patent, uh, patent team. And they're all mentioned in the book, by the way. And we come to the F-35. Right now, Northrop builds the center section for the F-35. But what you don't know is the hard work that a, Paul, that a man by the name of Paul Margisoto did in the early days of the Joint Strike Fighter, where he teamed with different companies, either Northrop was leading or a major teammate with Lockheed, Boeing, what have you, that led to a Lockheed choosing Northrop as their teammate. So we build about 40% of the entire value not build, but we gained about 40% of the flyaway cost of the airplane. Because we don't only build the center fuselage, we do the fire control radar, the distributed aperture system, which gives the pilot 360 degree visibility, the comm nav, a lot of software development, training system software, and we're very involved in the low observables of the F-35. So Northrop, yes, they're a subcontractor, but we, we do 40% of the job, not just build the center fuselage. Now we come to uh, early low observables. And uh, this effort right here, just get this set. This effort right here is uh, a, a large chapter in the, in the second book. And on the left side of the chart, you see the org chart, thanks to John Cashin, of what the RCS group looked like in December of 1974. Now what does that mean? What it means is that they were recognized by the United States Air Force for the fact that we could operate and predict radar cross-section using the latest codes. One of them is called GenSCAT and all the advanced work. Not only that, but we got involved in material research. Lockheed was way ahead of Northrop at one point, but, but Northrop caught up to this. And this, this group of people that I describe in detail in the book were the essence of, of building that capability. And on the right is the XXT full-scale model on a pole test that was being tested. Now, we lost that uh, program to Lockheed, but it demonstrated to the Air Force that Northrop had the credentials to almost win. We did not have a fly-by-wire system. Lockheed did, and their, their RCS from a certain quarters was better than ours. But as a system, it worked pretty damn well. And again, this was all part of the building blocks that led to Northrop's ascendancy. Now we come to a program called Tacit Blue. You might not have heard about this. This was part of the Pave Mover program. But what it developed was a unique type of side-looking radar that could look deep into enemy territory to spot tanks. But, and it had, to be, it had to be survivable. So it had a smooth curvature upper surface, broadband edge treatments, Stealthy antennas, a stealthy radar. And if you look at the upper picture and the lower picture, you see a lot of similarity between Tacit Blue and the B-2 bomber. 
So it wasn't necessarily all invented on the B-2. A lot of it came from that expertise that was developed on that program. Now we come to the advanced technology bomber, which was the B-2. Now originally, when John Paterno, who headed up all of advanced systems or advanced programs at the time, God rest his soul, talked to Colonel England, they said, how would you like to get involved in the, the advanced technology bomber? He says, we don't build bombers, sir. We only build fighters, more or less. And uh, he was urged to get involved, which they did. And that lower sketch is the sketch that was submitted in the proposal in June of 1979. And the model is what was used in, in the proposal. And lo and behold, Northrop won the, won the program based on a lot of hard work. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of the performance on the program, but I will tell you I spent days with Jim Canoe on the right, who was the program manager, Irv Wallen, the chief designer, and John Cashin on constructing this chapter to tell you the story about that. And uh, what happened is that the program is so complex is that they had to bring in people like George Diaz, some of you might remember, was a vice president, I got to know George very well, spent days with him, to manage the program of this size, manage the B2 program. And uh, not only that, but uh, thanks to Chris Hernandez, we, we have a term in the book called the executors. What happened is that the B2 program was successful and uh, it trained a lot of the young leaders of today. Many of them worked for Chris and they all became officers or what have you. So it was a training ground. And we come to the first flight. I also had a time, I spent the whole day with Bruce Hines and a couple of other pilots. There's a, there's a flight of the, there's a picture of the B-2 flying there. It had a huge bomb bay with tremendous capability and there he is getting doused with water. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but uh, it was and is today our front line of defense in many ways. Now we come to talking about unmanned systems, okay? And um, in that particular respect, let's talk about a company called Radioplane. Anybody ever hear of the name Reginald Denny? Well, many of you have, many of you have not. But uh, he was a British actor on stage and Broadway. And uh, he came to the United States and uh, and had an idea of building a radio-controlled airplane. That's shown on the upper left, called the RP-1. And uh, some leaders in the company, like first was the first engineering manager, and Collins and Larrabee uh, actually uh, ran the company. It became a subsidiary in 52, and then Northrop bought it. And on the lower left, they had a very exotic way of wind tunnel testing, <laughs> right? They flew on the fender, of large airplanes, dri uh, large uh, cars driving on the desert. Really, really quite, quite remarkable. And uh, if you, wa uh, how many have been at the Hall of uh, the Walk of Fame in LA? Okay, well if you look down, you'll see Reginald Denny's name there, uh, quite remarkable. And he hired a couple of engineers, one from Caltech and one from uh, another guy in, in electronics, I won't mention the name, but they're in the book. And they designed different engines for it and what have you. And the RP5 RP version of the RP1, they only built 15,000 of them in World War II. Absolutely remarkable. And now we come to Ryan Aircraft. This is a company with a long, long history, established in 1922 by Claude Ryan. Bob Mitchell, who I got to know, was the last CEO, he's on the upper right, of the company. And Northrop acquired it in 99. And, uh, they had built a variety of missiles, all of which are talked about in the book, just to give you a background of the strength that Ryan had. This was a tremendous acquisition by the, by the, by the company. And uh, so that led to one of the programs that they bid on before they were acquired called Global Hawk. It is operational today. It is an incredible system. And, uh, on the lower left, you see it in flight. On the right is a schematic, so to speak, or a picture of how it operates. It interfaces with space, air, and seaborne assets, and all of that information feeds into the battle commander. Today, when we go to war, someone will be selected as a battle commander to command all the resources, Army, Navy, you name it. And these systems provide all that information for him to make tactical decisions. A lot of people don't know that, but that's the way it works. 
And, uh, and the fellow on the upper, upper, upper left is, is uh, Bob Edinger, a good friend of mine. He was the chief of flight test on the F-16, and he brought a wealth of experience to guide the Global Hawk through development and what have you. And now we come to a couple of more airplanes. Uh, we've talked about the Global Hawk. This one is the Fire Scout. Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to work on this as a corporate consultant for a long period of time. And that's quite a remarkable airplane. Doug Fronius was the program manager on this program. And it was based on a Schweitzer helicopter, a cheap helicopter made in New York, believe it or not. And they had this idea of creating a surveillance ISR type system that could operate from frigates about 100 miles away. So they developed the A version. The B version, I was also involved in this as, as well, you can see a, a stub wing that was added to it for extra capability. And then they recently teamed, or back, they, they teamed with Bell to create a C version, which is operational today. So we have that, we have that capability. And that's the design team around the B version right there on the upper right. Now we come to the Pegasus. Leadership had changed, and you see pictures of Scott Seymour and uh, Doug Wood, who was the program manager. Scott Seymour was a Marine, and he, he was bold in his thinking. He invested $45 million to qualify Northrop Grumman to participate in DARPA's and the Navy's UCAV-N program. And what we built then was a totally autonomous system that was shown there in the test lab being checked out. It only had one flight, took off by itself, landed by itself, all the algorithms worked, everything worked, and that investment uh, were our credentials in order to compete for the next program called the uh, called the X-47B, or, or what the Navy was looking for at the time, which was a, a, a follow-on operational program. And there it is right there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because John Wittenberry is going to talk about that next month. John was very involved in the aerodynamics. I think I beat up John every day on the weight growth on the airplane. But be that as it may, that in the upper left is the design team that lost to Boeing that became the X-45A. We were determined to push ahead. That's why the previous program was funded. That's Dan Ryan on the lower left, with the chief designer who laid out the crank wing design with John's input. And we ended up with a system that could, that could land by itself and take off by itself from the carrier. It could operate within the landing pattern with manned aircraft, and it could also autonomously refuel itself. You probably all read about that, but quite a remarkable achievement. Now, we're getting near the end now, ladies and gentlemen. Are you still with me? OK. OK, so uh, let's, talk about Jack. let's talk about Jack Northrop. Well, what kind of a man was he? Well, I tried to describe that to you. But he emphasized streamlining, advanced structures, developed the flying wings, conventional aircraft. He ordered the development of a jet engine. It worked. They didn't team with GE. But in the end, it produced 11,000 shaft horsepower. It was late, but it worked. He got involved in computers, advanced materials, magnesium. One of the, one of the uh, remaining flying wing specimens here, the uh, inner fuselage is built out of magnesium. And he, and he instituted the new program structure. And he also got involved in a lot of non-commercial items, like anchors, boats, ski lifts, artificial devices, and what have you a truly genius man in its time. And now we come to the achievements that were, that were done in that period of time, from 1939 to 1951. There were 21 new aircraft. 13 of them were flying wings. Imagine what was done. And that is all shown there by the creation development phase and the first flight at the top. And you can read about them and what have you. I didn't touch on all the aircraft. There were transports. There was the N25 SNARK. The, the guidance system had to be done. The X, XF15, and then all of the flying wing versions. And now we come to a perspective on the company. Uh, I don't like to use the word I, but I created this chart to somehow capture the imagination and the leadership of the company 
that ensures that Northrop will be a world leader in aerospace in the future. I'm not exaggerating one iota. So what you see here are phase one, two, and three. Phase one is the pre-war, phase two is the post-war, and, and phase three of the high-tech emphasis. And you can see all the weapons, uh, the systems that were designed on the right portion of the chart by Northrop. And then you see the gradual progression of the F, F5A, E, G, the YF23, the XST, the, the tacit blue, and what have that all fed into the B-2 bomber. And then to the right, you have the F-18EF, the X-35 series, and the E-2D and the EA-18G, and everything else that John Wittenberry is working on on advanced programs. So the stage has been set for a successful future. And I'd like to, the last couple of charts, talk about the target and unmanned systems. If you include the acquisition of radio plane through the history of the company and the ones that Northrop got built, your over 87,000 units were delivered from World War II to today. If you include Ryan, the number is 108,000 systems were delivered. Absolutely remarkable story. And we come to the last chart, ladies and gentlemen. This is a picture of a lot of the Northrop veterans, Northrop Grumman veterans that I had lunch with over the years. I was able to spend time with a lot of them. A lot of them are gone now. I'm going to read you the last paragraph as I conclude the presentation. It has been an emotional journey since many of the Northrop and Northrop Grumman pioneers are no longer with us or became incapacitated during my communication with them. Memories of them and their accomplishments will sustain us now. For those who remain or who have passed on, we are a bit grayer now, and some are well into our 90s. Northrop Grumman will always be part of us, and at times we will gather, remember, and reminisce about those exciting years when we accomplished so much. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Sir. Uh, yeah, what are the trade-offs that were uh, done to arrive at the YF-23? Well, there are far more exports that have been commented on that, but I actually go through that in the book, the, the iterative process that went on. It wasn't only the aerodynamics, but they had to wrestle with survivability, both at altitude, high altitude, low altitude, like the aft deck, right? Uh, instead of having the inlets exposed directly to the airstream, they were blowing on a top-level deck. And my young friend over there, right, you had about, you had about six inches, right, of this was howling high acoustic noise and temperature, and they had to protect the structure. So they ended up with that. Lockheed went to thrust reversers, and that was a discriminator. It turned out to be in the end. So that was a big trade-off. But what Northrop emphasized there was survivability. It was a very survivable airplane. And even, even the plan form, how they ended up with the diamond plan form, it wasn't look like that initially, because they were driving towards low radar cross-section, and they ended up with a compromise. And uh, the propulsion system, the inlet, the positioning of the inlet, uh, because it had to curve like this and go up, that was iterated many times. Why? Be to keep the radar cross-section down, the reflectivity. So there were many, many trade-offs like that, and also in materials. Okay. Any other questions? Sir. Outstanding briefing, sir. Uh, you came from uh, Yes. The question is, why did I omit the F-14 Tomcat? Uh, because in the Grumman book, the aircraft designers of Grumman, I, there's a whole chapter devoted to the evolution of the F-14, how it actually came about. If Grumman did not work on the F-111B, we would have learned all the mistakes. We, we corrected them all on the F-14. And uh, that whole story is in the first book. Right, but I, I, uh, this is about Northrop, Northrop Grumman, and uh, so I elected not to cover it again because it was in the first book. Sir. Um, I think I'm not really totally qualified to do that, uh, but I will tell you that Mr. Cressa right here, right, who, who led the development of Northrop Grumman today, 
I'm not going to speak for him, but I will tell you that today, Northrop Grumman is one of the finer weapon systems integration houses in the world. You can design an airplane, but if you can't integrate the entire system, a B-21 is an example, I know nothing about it, but it represents a culmination of knowledge and leadership that led to the inherent strength of the company today, not only in airframe design, but in avionics, integration, software management, all that type of stuff is now in the company. And so uh, I would think that even on the space side, uh, by acquiring TRW, that was a major, major acquisition. Kent, did you want to add anything to that? Come on. <laughs> you always defer to the CEO. No. <laughs> the, the issue of uh, evolving the company to uh, what it's to Northrop Grumman uh, was really a decision uh, on whether or not uh, you would be relevant in the next century, this century. Uh, remember, this all happened and the, the world was collapsing. You had an option of either uh, getting bigger or selling to somebody else. Uh, that was in the, the 80s. Um, the decision was made by the board of Northrop that we could be uh, a survivor and that we had a lot of the capabilities that were going to be important for this generation, for this century. And uh, it, it involved making sure that you could integrate all aspects and that meant space and uh, aircraft uh, and communications uh, and radar and uh, cyber, all of that stuff was going to be important in this new, in this generation. And uh, the elements were all dispersed in the, in the industry. And the question was, how do you get there? And uh, we started on a very careful plan to, oh, it's not working? Oh, hi. You couldn't hear me. Huh? We, we, uh, th it was just a, a long, involved uh, iteration of acquiring, uh, once we decided to be a net acquirer, to acquire quality companies that could add to the value uh, of the future. Uh, one of the first ones we did was Grumman. And when we did that, uh, the, f the view was that the interest of Northrop to acquire Grumman was because they were another aircraft company. On the contrary, that was not the case. They had complementary capabilities uh, in, um, uh, in, in countermeasures, and uh, they were involved in, in, in the digital world. Northrop did not have any software uh, companies. We, uh, the previous management was very negative about getting involved and doing any digital work directly. I mean, we would be okay to have it in our own systems but not to be involved in software development. Um, you, this would be crazy in this generation. It was going to be a critical future. Uh, so there were many elements. Getting involved in space was terribly important. We were not really a major player in space. So all of those things were happening. TRW was a critical player, something that uh, I was CEO for many years, and I was interested in acquiring, getting involved with TRW for years. Uh, uh, didn't happen until very late in, in the, the period that I was involved, but once there was an opportunity, we got big enough so that we could acquire them. Uh, they kept on saying no, and uh, they were bigger than us for many years, but they were very enamored with the view of getting involved in the automotive industry in a bigger way. And the more they did that, the lower their stock went. The more we at Northrop did the right things and acquired things, the higher our stock came. And at a certain point, we could acquire them. And that was an unfriendly merger. I don't know if you recall. Uh, they didn't want to do it. Um, but eventually, everybody uh, agreed it was a good idea. Uh, they became friendly. Uh, we had a major celebration, as we always did when we acquired a new company, uh, with a huge activity uh, at TRW Space over here. In, uh, we had a huge tent, and um, one of the people that I invited to speak was Cy Ramo, who was, of course, uh, beloved and unknown by all the TRW people. 
and he went to the people and he, he got up and said, I'm thrilled with this acquisition. I think it's the right thing. And he says, you may ask, why do I think that? He said, well, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the original R in, in TRW. He said, and there's only one R in TRW. There's three R's in Northrop Grumman. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. Real treat. There's time for more questions. Sir. How is AI going to fit into your future? <clears throat> How is AI going to fit into our future? Uh, if I know anything about Northrop Grumman, I've been retired now about 12 years. They're deep into it, right? Uh, and uh, there are people that know far more about it than I do, but. Uh, there's no question that it's going to have an impact on, on aircraft design, the type of systems we want to. What's even more important is to step even farther back, because you have to look at the requirements of what's going to drive a confrontation in the future. You can see how the war is changing in the Ukraine, right? Right? Uh, because of the RPVs and what have you. You can say, well, that's a skirmish. That's, I mean, it's a lot of nonsense. Things are changing, and uh, thank God that the United States has advanced study programs in the Navy and the Air Force that are looking way out there. That's one of the great strengths of America in terms of planning where they want to go and what they want to do. I don't know the answer about AI, but I will tell you that there's no grass growing on anybody's feet on it. They're working on it hard. Okay, anybody else? Sir. Okay, your question is about how, how integration is, is, is done, right? I can tell you that's personally in being involved in that, <clears throat> and I'll just say this once as head of advanced programs at Grumman and then, and then coming out here and getting involved in the programs. That is a inherent basic trade-off uh, process that's used in the conceptual design of any new system. That's why I said, when you talk about the chief designer, he's surrounded by disciplines all around you. When we formulated the F-35, or when we formulated the F-14, now that was a long time ago, or the YF-23, reliability, life cycle cost, avionic systems costs, all of these things were inherent from the beginning. So the chief designer was not like sketching out on a piece of paper and you do the structure and that was it. It doesn't work that way. There are many, many iterative processes, which many of you are familiar with, within the Department of Defense now that are very rigorous in terms of how they approach a problem to dig it out. And uh, all of these disciplines that I know Chris Hernandez was very involved in on the B-2, and many of, many of you were uh, probably in, in your aspects of the, what you worked on were part of that. But we rest assured that as a leader, if I ever turned around and talked to the aerodynamicist, the ILS guy was right there, the R&M guy was right there, everybody was right there. We made a decision. And if you work in an integrated product team structure, it's forced on you by virtue of how it's done. So be rest assured that that's in there. I hope I answered your question. Sir. Um, I, don't, I don't know the detailed answer to that. I, I, the only thing I can tell you is the way that the military works is the Marine Corps were aware of that. They were not the driving design agent on it. Uh, but I will tell you, I will tell you that their operate was far more difficult than the Navy. Remember, they had land ops and, and uh, sea ops. They had to go to sea, they had to go on land. I remember when we were building the CD version of it, uh, the, the Marine Corps F-18s were breaking down. They had problems, so we took our best technicians and we sent it out in the field to Cherry Point to fix them because their operate was very tough and they literally beat the you-know-what out of the airplane. You know, it's just the way it is. So were they involved in the, in the initial design? I think they were aware of it, but I think it was driven more by the Navy and, and by uh, the other people. Anybody else? Going once, 
Going twice, sold. Thank you very much.